Hey everyone, it is Sean and Dave here from Saturday Morning Cartoons. We want to thank the following people for going to patreon.com slash Saturday Morning Cartoons and supporting our show. So a huge thank you to Derek Haynes. Dr. Jason Woods. Jamal Newman. Melanie Harker. Allison Keen. The one and only Sean Paul Ellis. And the amazing Dave Trumbor. Oh, thank you so much. Now, it might sound kind of weird that we are thanking some familiar people and ourselves in this list, but we want to let you listeners out there know that we are not just asking you to support us through Patreon. We are actually putting our hard-earned dollars uh, into the show as well. So we just want to say thank you to those who have supported. And for anyone who can't but would like to help, that, help out the show in some way, feel free to share our Patreon page within your social media circles. It would really help a lot. So thank you, guys. We appreciate you going to patreon.com slash Saturday Morning Cartoons to sponsor and support our podcast. And now, on with the show. Hello and welcome to Saturday Morning Cartoons, the weekly podcast that revisits, reviews, and ridicules some of the world's weirdest animated series. Coming to you from the island of Genosha, I'll be your co-host, Dave Trumbor. Joining me as always and representing the Hellfire Club, it's Sean Paul Ellis. How's it going, <laughs> bud? Uh, David, David, David. I'm doing well, buddy. How about yourself? I'm doing good. You have some like weird pamphlets that you're handing out to everybody in the office today. Um, uh, I'm just doing like a new club that you're a recruitment, with? recruitment effort for Hellfire yeah. Club. What exactly? It sounds, I mean, it sounds pretty cool. What, uh, uh, what's going on with this thing? I mean, we just have a lot of people that we're just trying to, to get on board. Uh, you know, we're just, we realize that we can't really kind of keep this as a, a family effort for okay. as long as we thought we would. And so we just figured we'd kind of branch out a little bit and kind of see if anybody's interested in hearing the good word about the Hellfire Club. What, uh, I mean, what's your, what's your like elevator pitch here? What, uh, can I join? Can anybody join? Yeah. What, oh, no. I mean, okay. we are, we are a, we are a 501c3 nonprofit, okay. sure. uh, registered in, uh, in the United States. And, uh, mm-hmm. we are, we are all inclusive. Uh, the only thing we ask is that you have some kind of mutant power. It's oh, like the okay. one so, stipulation. Well, I mean, what's your like, metric for measuring like does it have to be like super cool like do i have to have like razors in my hands or no. can i just be like weirdly tall and angular is that does that I mean, count look we can't we can say for certain mm-hmm. who's a mutant and who's just a regular norm and so okay i'm gonna i'm gonna that's fine i'm a little triggered by that terminology but that's fine I'll, all right I'll well look you. you you don't have to worry dave you're not okay. you're not a norm you don't have oh, to worry okay. about it all right what you're telling me is that you feel super. Mm-hmm. You feel like you might have super powers, feel, some yeah. super mutant abilities. And so I don't care if it's something as super cool as parkour. You know, I'm down with that. Okay. I don't care if it's something where you're just like, I can eat an entire box of toaster strudels in one sitting. Mm. That's a now pretty that super power. That's, that's pretty super power. But I have, a, I have a question for you. Do you guys, I mean, it seems like a pretty cool prestigious club. Do you have like a dress code? Is there anything? <laughs> I'm glad you asked, man, because yeah, uh, because I don't want to show up with not you know not the right attire. No, no. I mean, look, if you're coming to if you're coming to a new event, you want to make sure that mm-hmm. you're prepared for this. Yeah, First yeah. impressions go a long way, and so uh, we're looking and we're thinking flashy. Also, okay. along the lines of flashy, sharp pieces of your costume, as many sharp pieces as possible. When you say sharp pieces, are you saying like? physically sharp like can cut myself or yeah, like yeah, yeah fashionably sharp oh no, no no we're talking like like both like you want like both. okay you want this to be something where you're going to potentially cut yourself uh you want to you want to i mean that's just me that's part of my mm-hmm. hellfire experience oh, it could be something okay. where you decide that you just want to walk around shirtless uh with mm. a pair of pants or it could be something where you decide that you want to dress like you're somebody from the 1700s. There are a wide variety of things that are available in the Hellfire Club for you to pick up on, Dave. This is what I was wondering. I have like a nice, uh, like a throwback kind of dandy with like the cravat and the, and the, the waistcoat and the high ankle socks and the buckled shoes. Ooh, slap and a cod just, piece on and you're ready, buddy. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, cool. So I'll bring that. I'll bring toaster strudels and we'll do parkour. We're going to rock out the Hellfire Club. Our I... ladies... Uh, are ladies, is it exclusive to gentlemen or are ladies allowed in the Hellfire Club? Uh, ladies are allowed in the Hellfire oh, Club. Oh, fantastic. How progressive um, of you. Uh, it, is, it is literally anything that they want to wear. Uh, mm. I will say this, though, as sort of like a heads up. 
Uh, mm-hmm. A majority of the women are either look like they're dead ghosts or they're wearing next to nothing. So okay. just just a heads up. I don't make these rules. This is just me allowing women to be empowered and wear whatever they want in the Hellfire Club. Got it. It sounds like a cool place, and I'm looking forward to it, but we should probably talk about tonight's cartoon. What do you think? Oh, my God. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please. Oh, my God. So, so clearly we're speaking of something from the X-Men universe, right? What could it possibly be? Oh, uh, man. We are talking about Wolverine and the X-Men. Yeah, uh, and if tonight. you're not familiar with this one, which you may not be, it's relatively recent, not quite as famous as the 90s series. Sean's going to walk you through the history of this particular show. Sure. So Wolverine and the X-Men is a 2009 American animated series by Marvel Animation. It is the fourth animated adaptation of the X-Men characters, the other three being Pride of the X-Men, X-Men the Animated Series, and X-Men Evolution. It ran for a total of 26 episodes on the Nicktoons Network, which is very confusing. (laughs) Yeah, pretty weird. One of many confusing things about this show, not a Nicktoon, not, you know, created for or developed by Nickelodeon. It just happened to air on the Nicktoons network. So there you go. Yeah. As for what the show is actually about, the story begins with Wolverine deciding to leave the X-Mansion. But when an explosion occurs, Charles Xavier and Jean Grey disappear and the entire X-Mansion is pretty much destroyed. The X-Men team disbands and its members go their separate ways. Cyclops isolates himself, Storm travels to Africa, and Iceman moves back into his parents' house in the suburbs. One year later, the MRD, short for the Mutant Response Division, an anti-mutant government-supported organization, begins capturing mutants from all over the country. This causes Wolverine and Beast to join forces and bring the defunct X-Men team together again. Uh, How do you like that? I mean, I think that there's a little bit of humor in sort of the setup. You know, obviously the idea that Iceman goes back and lives with his parents. Yeah. Um, we have Scott Summers acting very emo, which if you've ever seen anything with Scott Summers, that's pretty much like, him. Is him to a T. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, we. So I mean, it, it's kind of an interesting setup that you know they would kind of disband and go in their their opposite directions. But you would think though for like. And this is just my conjecture on this, that you would think that for mm-hmm. a team that is so bonded to a location being the X-Mansion, that it would truthfully be something that in light of it exploding and no longer yeah. being there, I don't know, they would maybe do a little bit of detective work. Maybe this would turn into sort of a, yeah. like, a, a, I don't a know, a quest for vengeance, <laughs> you know, yeah, or just something. A, they just, someone essentially just like assassinated your leader, your idol. And then one of the other most powerful mutants the world has ever seen. And you guys are just like, mm, I guess we'll just go away from here and not try to rebuild this place or figure out what happened. I mean, technically, yeah, Wolverine is kind of on the case to figure out what happened. And we do find out what happened by the end of the first season. Uh, it's just a weird <laughs> first, setup. First and just like, only season. First and only <laughs> season. Yeah. It's a weird setup, though, to be like, this crazy thing happened. And then this team that was so close just decided to peace out, just leave. Right. It's, it's a weird way to set it up, but it kind of makes sense because what else are you going to do? Right. I, I do want to note, uh, you know, in, in kind of understanding a little bit more about this show is that I guess people really enjoyed this show. Yeah. Uh, and, and this was something that they were slated to do a second season. Oh, yeah. And they set of, it up in a big way. Yep. Oh, and they, they, like, they even, uh, what was it, during uh, Comic-Con in 2009, they mm-hmm. showed like a whole bunch of stills and, and things and they were bringing in like they were bringing in a whole, and and this is what's crazy, they had so many characters in season one that just felt yeah. like they were just kind of there, uh, whether it's like for coloring in the background or or whatever. But season two felt like it was like, hey, what mutants did we miss? How can we get them on here? Because they were like, let's get Cable, let's do Colossus, Deadpool, Havoc, Jubilee, Magic. I had to look up Magic. I didn't know With who K, that. Yeah. yeah, I did not know who that was. They were going to bring in <laughs> Holocaust, Holocaust, Sunfire. Yikes. Uh, Anytime you bring in the untouchable, Holocaust, you yeah. know that you're struggling. But like, I mean, we'll, we'll explain why, uh, yeah. why they would have done that because it actually plays in well to sort of how the finale of this ended. And so I think tonight... Yeah, and that's what we'll talk about tonight as well. I actually watched the premiere. <clears throat> I watched the first episode as well to kind of get some context on this. So it'll, it'll help to bookend it. And we'll explain some things that were taken care of in the, the season itself, because 
there are things that happen in the finale that you're just like, wait, what? <laughs> if you just jump there and watch it for some reason. Go ahead, Sean. On the other hand, I felt like, or I only watched the finale, and I felt right. like I had the proper amount of context, and I spent the proper amount of time watching this show. I think we're going to have a difference of opinion on this one, because I enjoyed it. I would kind of like to watch more of it, but it's on that, it's on that scale of I probably never will. Like we've said, we've said in the past for certain shows where it's like, man, I would love to watch some more of this, but only a few times, maybe a handful of times, five tops. Right. I don't know how many we've ever actually done. I know you're watching One Piece now. Oh you're man, I'm up like, on that. I'm on like the Arlong Pirate uh, yeah, yeah. saga now. So if if you remember a couple of weeks ago when we did uh, with Alex uh, Kazanis, um, we talked about One Piece. And I had just watched my first episode, season one, right. episode four. I'm now almost done with the first season, which is like yeah, 54 exactly. episodes. It's a lot. Yeah. So it's a, I, I've been really binging hard on that because the show is just so much fun. Uh, and and I, I just think like for me, like when we've said that in the past, like I rarely had the time or inclination to go back and watch more stuff. Like I said it about Gundam. I really want to go back and watch it. Don't have the time. I think the only thing I went back and watched was like more Centurions just because it was ridiculous. But that was oh, also really? like two and a half years ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that was just more for like nostalgia just because I loved it. But I don't know, man, like this probably isn't one that I'm going to go back and watch a lot more of. But yeah, we'll get there. Let's jump into the theme song or what passes for a theme song in this particular show. Oh, boy. All right. So I'm going to start this off by saying. Yeah. A uh, couple of really confusing points. One, okay. nothing is nothing is ever gonna measure up to the '90s X-Men: The Animated Series theme song with a mm-hmm. uh, like nothing is ever going to compare to that theme song. And when this came on, I was like, please let this have some even like small, tiny little element that is gonna bring it back, or like it's gonna be somewhat nostalgic to this the series reintroduce it for you know uh, an audience almost 10 years later like please have something something that's gonna like help bring me in and it had nothing it was what? really it, i don't think it really had anything in the background what? that was key. you really don't think so no. i think i disagree i think it played with the theme of it it just like twisted it a little bit i, I just felt that it was i very really muted. thought you were gonna be like i was so happy to hear the thing no the i was not i was what? really i mean i've watched it now three times and, uh, and, and we, we've talked about this all, uh, every once in a while. This was a dedicated theme song that sort of acted as an yep. introduction. Uh, none of the animation that was in the theme song is something that was ever going to be used in the actual show itself. What was a little bit confusing is that be dropping in at the finale of episode 26, they were already fighting Sentinels or getting ready to fight Sentinels. And in then, the show itself. Yeah, right. And, and then, then the this theme scene. song kind of came on and I was like, oh, cool. Wow. They jumped right into the fight sequence in this. I was like, well, that's, that's kind of fun. And then sort of like this music died in the background and kind of the team, like at the very end, kind of assembled like Wolverine yeah. and the X-Men. And I was like, oh, yeah. that was the intro. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fuck me. Like, <laughs> What was interesting though is like with this theme, look, like the 90s, the 90s theme is great. I, I disagree. I think that this theme does have throwbacks to it. They're, they're here and there and they're, they're twisted enough that it's not the exact same thing, but there's flourishes of it. It also sounds very kind of, it's got kind of a minor tone to parts of it. It's very like orchestral and it's got some progressions that are similar to even like Batman, the animated series. So it's almost like a mashup of X-Men, the animated series and Batman. I'm not saying it works. I'm just saying it's kind of, they kind of took those two tones and smashed them together. But like if I asked you to hum a little bit of that orchestral tone. Oh God, I have no idea. Yeah, no, I, yeah, that's that's the thing is like for the Batman, for Batman and for, for X-Men, the animated series in the 90s, those things, I mean, and, and we just mentioned, we always say like, oh, I'm going to go back and watch more of these series. And like, they're readily available. I can plop down and watch all of Batman TAS yep. on Amazon. I can watch all of, uh, what was, I, can wa- I can watch all of X-Men on Hulu uh, without any trouble whatsoever. And I, I think I did watch a couple episodes of X Men, but I, I kind of stopped at some point. I only watched like maybe yeah. two or three more. Like, but that theme song is so distinct. You can play that in anywhere, and all of a sudden my ears will perk up. With this one, I was like, oh, there is like you have such an an opportunity to mix this so that this orchestral background is really driving the action that's going on, yeah. and it just didn't do that for me. No, and I agree. It just kind of is there. I mean, yeah, it's fine. It, and and complicating things is like. 
Look, in the 90s series, the, the cool thing was like the animation, it did a cool roll call of all the characters. So like everybody would get their own kind of like cool title card moment. Like Iceman, but, well, I don't know if Iceman had one, but like Cyclops would have one and Beast and Wolverine and Jubilee <laughs> and Storm and everybody, they would all have like their own like title card moment. But at the same time, like there was that driving uh, music in the background. This one, they're just kind of like, they're like, you already know these characters, they're going to fight Sentinels <laughs> and here's some music with some like fighting noises over it. And it's just kind of, meh, just kind of smashed in there. So yeah. the, the noises and the, and the sound effects really kind of mask the music to begin with. When you hear it clean by itself, it sounds better. It's still not memorable. Now, yeah. granted, to compare two shows that we watch like hundreds of episodes of, even if, you know, it was repeat viewings or whatever, in the 90s, where that stuff is like deep in your brains and deep in your neurons versus stuff that we just watched probably today two or three times, <laughs> it's not going to be as memorable. But yeah, I, I agree with you that it's not quite as, uh, not quite as strong. And it's a weird intro because it's not, it looks like it's part of an episode. Like it does. You like, you know, Especially for that last episode where they literally are fighting sentinels in the streets. And that's, that's what happens in the intro is they just fight sentinels in the streets. It's tough. I do like the intro though, where they, they show the MRD kind of going after mutants and like these two, um, you know, jackbooted thugs are going after these kids who are labeled as mutants and Wolverine literally drops right in front of their sensors. <laughs> it's like, that's a cool intro for Wolverine. Who's going right. to be our hero throughout the series. But then after that, there really wasn't a cool moment to be had in the intro. So yeah. It was actually, uh, I, I'd say that moment where they yeah. sort of have those soldiers and the Sentinels kind of identifying that those two young kids are mutants. Mm -hmm. That is probably one of the most redeeming things just because it sort of shows you the justice aspect yeah. that kind of Wolverine, you know, because he's such a loner and the show, he's obviously now the, the titular character yeah. uh, and he's always been a standout ex-man, ex-person, um, you know, on the team that everybody loves. And so uh, to kind of have him in that role was, was nice. I, I think that that yeah. was, I think you're right. I think you're right on that one. I agree. Cool. Um, do you want to get, I mean, we'll get into the animation style, but we've talked a little bit offline about the cast as well. Do you want to talk about the, maybe we'll mention the casting and whether you think they're properly cast when we get to the characters themselves. You want to do that? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, cool. So first we're going to jump to the animation style of this. So what was your first in person, first impression of the animation style of uh, Wolverine and the X-Men? Uh, it was okay. It was okay, sigh, no, it was okay because sigh. if you've ever watched X, if you've ever watched X Men Evolution, it didn't right. feel like this was too much of a far cry from that animation style. And so, you know, the uh, let's be honest, the the X Men from the '90s was like really flashy, like it was really '80s '90s inspired. And this one had an opportunity to kind of really carve out its own niche, you know, in the late 2000s, and and kind of adhere to some really interesting styles. And it sort of went back to some of the more basic costuming that we, we saw for especially Logan and for, for Emma Frost, um, you know, uh, Scarlet Witch. And so all, all of these characters look to see and, and be kind of identical to like what you would imagine them to be in a comic book character, only like slightly updated. And, and X-Men Evolution, I thought, did a kind of a good style of, of bringing yeah. that artwork into the 2000s. And kind of yes. introducing a new character and some new ideas in terms of what was going on. And I felt like this was like, you know what? You guys got it. We're just going to copy paste whatever we have from Evolution into this crap. Yeah, it looked like a weird combination of like the 90s series and Evolution. Because it was, from what I remember, the 90s series was like fairly detailed and fairly yeah. realistic looking. Realistic in quotes because these are obviously like superhero proportion comic book Cartoon characters character. and also cartoons. <laughs> but like as far as like realistic like hair and shadowing and facial hair and body hair, I mean there's how many uh episodes where Wolverine's like walking around shirtless or in his like uh either like the wife beater or that like that white tee and you see like every stinking hair on his arm, his yeah. knuckles or whatever. And even the claws, like they look they're just detailed and the, there's attention to detail and there's time taken on each of the frames. And they're not perfect, but they do have its own style. Everything's got, you know, meticulous uh, details in the designs and the costumes. Sure. This, this was, I mean, if Evolution went in more, a more kind of like cartoonish, freer direction, but they still had some interesting aspects to those characters. They still kind of stood out. This is kind of like halfway between both of those. And honestly, it's, it's not, it's okay. It's fine. Like the proportions I thought were weird, right? So shoulder, everybody's got huge shoulders. Yeah. Everybody's got like non-existent waists. 
one of my favorite um, comments from like a YouTube page was like, everybody on this show skipped leg day because everybody's got these <laughs> tiny spindly legs, but they're like jacked up top and they look kind of top heavy and silly. Their hair never moves. Their clothes yeah. never move. It looks, it looks cheaper. It looks cheaper. Let's yeah. just put it that way. I agree. And I, I like yeah. the fact that sort of with the, uh, with sort of like the, the fixed with shoulder proportions and sort of like these upside down triangle bodies yeah. um, that they had for everybody that um, they, they really tried to kind of like standardize at some point, like what the like quote unquote X-Man uniform looked like. <laughs> right. And it, it felt like this was like their opportunity where they could be like, oh man, we can make this really distinct and we can make this really like combat worthy. And it was just black and gold. And like the black, yeah. the black of the of the suit just kind of blended in with like this grim black and brown background the entire time. Yeah. Like it didn't stand out. It like other than these dumb fucking shoulder pads that they had on, they kind of looked like Judge Dredd, like for yeah. like for better or worse. The, the and like things that stick off the sides, especially Magneto, who's yeah. just like ridiculous. Yeah. The entire time, I was hoping somebody would just take off a mask and be Carl Urban, and I'd be like, "Yes, what are we doing here? Let's make this yeah. happen." That's what uh, I did love that about the 90s series because it did harken back to like the 90s comics run where everything right. was like bold primary colors, like didn't give a fuck. Like Cyclops was out there in like bright, almost sky, <laughs> like cobalt blue unitard <laughs> with the yellow underoos. And a, and a, didn't he have like a, a utility belt, which he never fucking used? Almost yeah. Almost irritated me. Yeah. It's like, like, Scott, you spent all that time pouring your muscles into that unitard, slapping that little, them, them little yellow briefs and boots and gloves on. And you get a utility belt. And you don't use it. You just blast people and then whine all day. I never understand you. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense to me. I never understand you. You know, but even back in the 90s. Saying, yeah. Well, in, in the 90s, like, Logan had, like, you know, that really bright yellow with, like, the, oh, yeah. like, the black stripes, like, on his shoulder pads. Yeah. And then didn't he have kind of, like, blue underoos? He had blue like underoos. His, same yeah. As, yeah. And he had a utility belt. What the fuck is up with giving people everybody in... utility belts. I, yeah, but, like, there's... We only Why are they really, not... Here's my question. Why are they not acceptable in daily wear? I don't know. I feel like they'd be really rad. They'd be super cool. You could put like Skittles in there, whatever you want. Oh, man. I don't know why I went to Skittles <laughs> well, first. I was Skittles the first fucking thing. I don't know. I guess I want Skittles. But you put them in your utility Jesus. Belt. You know, at any point in time, you could just get Skittles. You know that, yeah. thing, and Just like put them but in your you, pocket. But if you got them in a little pouch, you don't need to get them. You got them. But That's the moral of the story. If you got it, you don't need to get it. <laughs> this is like... Trademarked. Oh God! Trademarks. I don't even want a cartoon. Oh God! I don't know. Uh, utility belts are great. I love them. Nobody uses them enough. Batman's like the only one who uses them. Probably Deadpool too. But that's it. Um, <laughs> for the rest of this animation style, I liked the action level was okay for some of it. Like when they actually got to use their powers, it was pretty cool. Wolverine's claws not great. They no. looked like digital claws on a traditionally drawn body. It was they weird. looked like boring aluminum foil. Like aluminum it it foil like, that was like, like, I'm fucking bored. Yeah. It if looked you could like, personify aluminum foil and it was, if like Reynolds rap could just be like, you know what? I give the fuck up. That would be Wolverine's claws in this. It basically looked like, like fake silver, like fake, uh, <laughs> fine, fine silver cutlery. It looked like silver plate. <laughs> Silver spoons. Mm. Uh, it just didn't look great. There was a lot of it that didn't look great. It look, it, you can tell it looked cheap. Like it looked like it was made on the cheap. And it's fine. The animation style is fine. Uh, Emma Frost is probably my favorite drawn character in the show. I mean, she's just a lot of, lot of, lot of female. There's a lot of her to go around. A lot of, lot of female top stuff going on. She was like the only, like Jean Grey, whatever. Emma was like, she was drawn like she is in the comics. They did yeah. not skimp on that part. But, no. yeah. but again, everybody's proportions are ridiculous. Top heavy, non-existent, below the waist. Yeah. Can I mention a character design that has been up for debate to help us transition into talking about these characters and some of the Interesting. casting? Interesting. I'm curious. Tell me. Okay. Uh, I actually really liked the design that they had for Apocalypse that we find at the very end. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Blowing this uh, out of the water. I gonna disagree on that one i don't know he looked big and he looked beefy and strong and he had the crazy suit and like the it's, shaved head with like the the weird kind of etching that's in it and he looked massive he looked the, the, the suit and the body were fine the face some he looked like a rodeo clown to me there was something oh, about the really? way his face animated or moved when he smiled i was just like oh that does what not was look it? good 
Was he standing next to Mr. Sinister and the Winter Soldier? Is that who that no. was? No. Do you know who that actually is? Who? That's Cyclops. No way. It's Future Cyclops. It's Future Shut Cyclops. The... I had to look it up. But it's Shut Future Cyclops up. is one of his horsemen. He's only got one uh, laser eye. Yeah. No fucking way. Yeah. That kind of Mr. Sinister look. It looked pretty cool. It looked like yeah. the, um, uh, what's the arc? There's a mid, mid to late 2000s arc. Well, probably mid 2000s. Um, where Sinister's kind of like, he's kind of like got a sexy kind of like slick back hair look to him with obviously like the white face and the diamond in the middle of yeah. his forehead and the, the blue black armor and all that stuff. But he's kind of more, um, I don't know, not androgynous, but he's like just sleek. definitely got kind of like a slick, sleek kind of sex appeal to him. Okay. Um, he doesn't have the crew cut of the 90s <laughs> version. Um, so that was a cool look. And then I was just like, yeah, who the fuck is this guy? It's Cyclops. <laughs> And he's still I, got a fucking utility belt. God, and he's damn. not fucking. He even had a shoulder pouch at that point too. He did. That's he had like, like a. Is this like a he half had like a satchel. Knockoff? Yeah. Half yeah. Cake. God damn. He had a fucking satchel or like yeah. a, a bandolier he that had, had a little utility. Yeah. yeah. He was dropping. A, he works for UPS in the future. That's right. Fun fact. That's all future he does. Future UPS. That's the standard uniform for the future <laughs> UPS. Like, like if you, ruby eye patch. <laughs> if you don't like, if you don't like their their service. They're just gonna burn and eviscerate your body. Yeah, so em- just, em- uh, just emulate your body. No problem with that. I see John, this being a positive. You have, you have nothing more to worry about. Oh, guys. But now for Apocalypse, I was not I was not down with that style. I still love the '90s, uh, the '90s version. Okay. Where he's like, he looks like part machine. He looks kind of like techno organic. I could never quite figure out what he what was going on with him. I like that. Okay, fair yeah, enough. I'm gonna stick with that. All right, cool. You uh, want to jump into the characters then? Who we get to get meet? The... I'm gonna have a slightly different list from you because I again watched the first episode. So mine's hmm. I got to see Colossus. Uh, I got to yeah. see Nightcrawler a little bit more. I got to see a little more I, of Rogue. I, I, yeah. Well, do we want to? I mean, I know that we kind of have hinted at this, but we we kind of have. Uh, and this is what's hard about this show and took me like, I want to say maybe 30 seconds to realize what was going on, but we kind of have people that are in two different times. Yeah. So that's more in plot. Um, we, we can touch on it, but yeah, it took sure. me a second because we, what threw me was when Xavier appeared to Logan and then Xavier was next to Logan. I was just like, the fuck is going on? So they <laughs> yep. are in two different time periods. So it is sort of like days of future past, right? Right. Where there's a team in the future where the Sentinels have kind of laid waste to everything. And there's a team in the past where they have a chance of correcting that and, and saving it, uh, preventing that future. Right. And Logan and, and Xavier exist in both. And I know that that's plot. I only bring it up just because the, yeah. like, when we talk about the characters, like, you know, they, everybody seems to have, like, two different costumes. Or it's weird because in certain instances, there's a character that's in the future but not in the past and vice versa. And so you're just like, right. oh, okay, got it. And there's a lot of time jumping around here because we start in the first episode, like, a year before. And then we jump to, obviously, a year later. And then we jump. So uh, much like time jumping. Who knew that the future. Years later. Who yeah. knew that the entire future just had some type of an Instagram filter over top of it that just made everything really red? Who yeah, knew? it's weird. It was very bizarre. It's very weird. It's very strange. Very strange. Ugh, but yeah, so who, massive uh, who, do you want, who do you want to talk about first? You want to start by talking about Logan? Yeah, let's get into Logan. Let's jump right into um, him. Sure. I think we've kind of already talked about his claws enough, but I mean, you know, we get kind of the standard, uh, you know, costume that you would, you would have for him. Um, both, both the X-Men, the fighting costume and his kind of like day-to-day costume wear, where he's just right. like blue jeans and a white shirt. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, over the course of this, he's you know, the, these 26 episodes, he becomes sort of the de facto leader and he's, yeah. he's really worried about, you know, uh, Chuck. Uh, he's really worried about Xavier as he, or Chuck as he refers Chuck. to him as, um, you know, but uh, I, I think, uh, I think for this character and I also think for the, the voice actor, like it's it was, with the exception of the claws um, and then the addition of really, really big mutton chops uh, yeah. at some point. Um, it's sort of what you come to expect for Logan. Like, good gravelly voice you know for all intents and purposes i don't think it stood out it just sounded like nine times out of ten he was like and you're just like i don't want to i don't want to trust you and you're like out of my way bub bub he never said bub i don't think i heard he never did i was bummed about that i was Um, he called beast chewy at one point that was fun (laughs) um i wrote down so this was steve bloom right so we're talking like spike spiegel Steve Bloom been around a long time. Great, uh, great actor, great voice actor. For this one, I thought his voice was better for Logan 
than it was for Wolverine, if that makes sense. So when Logan does his sort of like regular dialogue, and, and again, this Logan that we're introduced to is not sort of the feral Weapon X. He's not, initially, he's not the loner who's off in the Canadian wilderness and they have to kind of bring him in or unleash right. him on things. He's grown to be part of this team. He's grown into a leadership position and he's grown to a position of respect among everybody else at the school. So he's quieter. He's more like even tempered. When he speaks to people, it's just conversational. It's not... He's not growling at you. He's not going to rip your throat out at any given second. Right. It's almost when he puts that costume on is when he goes sort of more feral. He stops <laughs> talking for the most part, and he just kind of growls at you the whole time. I think Steve Bloom's voice is better for Logan than it was for Wolverine. I would agree. I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. He's okay with the growling and stuff, but not, not as great as whoever the guy was in the 90s. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know your name off the top of my head. No. I mean, it was, uh, oh my God, it's... Uh... Is it Caffel J. Dodd, wasn't it? Uh, if it is, how could I possibly have forgotten that? I'm looking, I'm looking it up right Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Uh, Caffel J. He was great. Dodd. He yeah. was great. And honestly, Fantastic. that's like between him and Hugh Jackman, like that's Wolverine to me. Right. Steve Bloom did okay. He did fine. I just thought he did better as Logan. Yeah. Right. No, I agree. What other, uh, what other main characters do you have that are kind of the union between the two episodes that we've seen? Yeah. I mean, I guess kind of the major ones. I, so Beast. let's get into let um, let's get into Beast. So Beast, Beast doesn't one. play a huge role in the finale. Right? Doesn't really do a fucking thing except but, get thrown into a building at some point. <laughs> yeah, and be really stupid for some reason. He like fires metal missiles at Magneto, which guess what, Beast? You don't need to be around for twenty six episodes to know that's probably not the best idea. Super genius. But um, do you, I mean, do you remember the line that Magneto has? Because we can. I mean, I don't think said. there's too much. There's not too much that we have for uh for uh for beast in this yeah. in this sense here. he had a bigger role in the first episode i'll touch on that did he what did he what did he specifically do okay so in the first episode beast is still like after the mansion's been destroyed beast is still like hard at work trying to figure out what happened so he's in the basement of the destroyed mansion in his laboratory which is like falling apart all around him and he's trying to figure out what happened so he says like clearly xavier was the target uh because he's gone missing and so has gene um but he's like, it's, it wasn't biological, it wasn't uh, an explosive, it wasn't a, a thermonuclear, whatever. It wasn't any of this stuff. So he's trying to figure out what's going on. But essentially, the beast that we meet is a pacifist. He's still huge, he's hulking, he's incredibly strong and agile. And he can be terrifying if he's like acting, if he's being like his Shakespeare thespian act. But he's a pacifist, like he doesn't want to hurt people, which is really interesting. They played that up a lot more than they did in the, in the X-Men 90s series, I think. Um, he was definitely shown to be an intellectual in the 90s series. He's always like hanging around, reading a book, well, because he, he becomes a, he becomes a, uh, like a politician. Yeah. In, at like, one or point. he's sort of, he, yeah, I think he serves as like counsel to the president, like on mutant yeah. affairs. He's like a liaison or an ambassador for right. mutant affairs. Exactly. And he's always, he's always like that, but this was more like an overt pacifism. Like he gives a couple of the guards. He's like, look, you don't really want to, like, I don't want to fight you. You don't want to get hurt. So let's just not do this. And then obviously the guard falls off and tries to shoot him anyway, so he takes him apart. But um, Beast was interesting, and he <laughs> served as like a partnership with Logan to then go after the rest of the team and try to bring people back together. So gotcha. that's kind of what he did. I thought the voice work was great. Uh, this was Fred Tatashore, um, another veteran of the craft. Uh, he, was, he was fine. He was great. Yeah, and he plays a bunch of different yeah. characters. Yeah, in this usually thing. like he's, the deeper kind of gravel yeah. yeah, He is Beast, he's Hulk, Blockbuster, and Juggernaut yeah. in this so series. Yeah, so he's the heavies. He's, yeah. he's good for the heavies because he's, he's got a, that deep, deep gravelly thing. Yeah. Uh, but deep. So to, to transition into this, we have this moment where we have Beast who's shooting these missiles uh, at Magneto. And like I, I want to say 30 seconds before, Magneto has a line where he just goes, building an army of metal men to attack the master of magnetism. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, not great. Yeah, I will say this. Time, I love, I love that Magneto gets his ass handed to him in this episode because that oh doesn't my often God. happen. Yes, which is weird because guess what? He's super cool, right? But he's just the master of magnetism. Like, in the broad scheme of things, is not the best. When we power. when we get into plot, I wanna, I, yeah, I wanna yeah. take this to task because there's there's a lot of problems that I have. He's got some kind family of this, problems going on too. Not only family problems, but they've just yeah. got some plot problems in general with this show yeah. where they're just like, oh no, a thing has happened. And then they get like, Mag lot. Oh, 
I don't think rush is even the word. I mean, they Sonic the Hedgehog the fuck yeah. out of this. Gotta go fast. This, yeah, they they shoveled in as they shoehorned as much as they possibly could into this. And finale. this and most of this series was broken into like each episode was like a part one or two or three. Like the episode that I watched tonight was Hindsight Part One of two or three. The one that we watched was Foresight Part Three, and the and the finale. So I mean, there's no reason for that. <laughs> I don't know why they rushed through everything so crazy. Um, I don't know. Probably the only other characters to really focus on, uh, I'd say probably Scott, Emma Frost, and Jean Grey briefly. Oh, I was gonna say uh, Chuck. Got to uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I guess Charles, that makes sense. Charles for a second. Let's, let's talk about Xavier. He the I, Xavier's. I feel really bad saying this um, because, okay. uh, you know, cause, because I, I'm not the person who was doing it. And it's, it's not like I was the, you know, that specific person, but um, the voice acting. Yeah, don't feel bad. That, Critical eye. Yeah. yeah, I know. But just the, the voice acting that they had for Professor X, I, I did not enjoy that. And that was Jim Ward. Um, yeah. And Jim Ward's been around and he's done tons and tons of stuff. Um, and he's been around for quite some time. I, I just, I don't know what it is. Like, I know that we always kind of have this idea that Professor Xavier is, is very like well spoken. It's sort of right. like a little bit of like maybe like a British undertone. Patrick to Stewart, it. just say Patrick. Yeah, Stewart. Patrick Stewart. Yeah. It's Patrick Stewart, guys. Patrick Stewart, yeah. or yeah. uh, you know, uh, James McAvoy. Sure. You know, like I'm good with with both of them. I think they both sure. do a, a a fantastic job as a uh, Charles Xavier. I would say though in this. Jim Ward just was not doing it for me. For some reason, it didn't sound British. It sounded Irish and Scottish matched, like mashed <laughs> because together. Because he's a New Yorker, so it sounded yeah, and he's like... and he's he's like a straight up new New Yorker, and like yeah. it was, it just did not, it didn't connect for me. And so every time he talked, I was like, who the fuck is this? Because sometimes he would like <laughs> he would talk off screen. There'd be like a VO, like there'd be a voiceover off screen. And yeah. something would be happening, and then it would cut to Charles continuing that talk. I'm like, who the fuck is that? Oh, my. <laughs> this idiot? His design fuck. was a little weird, too, because he just looked like a bald dude standing around. Like, there wasn't a lot to he distinguish him. He looked like a bald dude that at some point, like, with, like, whatever silly putty dome that he had, somebody had been like, oh, I just kind of want to see if I can just, can I just, just push it in, it in a little, little bit? Can I just yeah. mush it in a little bit? He's a like, little mushed. I, I'll say this. I don't know. Say I don't it. know why. Professor X's fucking head looked like it looked lumpy. I don't he looked like he looked like Egghead from the old Batman series. <laughs> he looked like Vincent Price's Egghead, like like with a fake prosthetic egg on his head. Yep, yep, that was it's it just, pretty. It, there's it's so not good. many things about this this series that were like it's like close but not quite. Like it's just it just misses the mark in in subtle, sometimes subtle, sometimes overt ways. But yeah, the voice acting is some of it. I will say I I believe it's Carrie Walgren. Who did um, Emma Frost? Uh, I thought she was really good. Whoever it was that played Emma Frost, I thought was really good because there she has a crazy arc that she kind of has to go through. She's essentially yeah. part of the inner circle of uh, Hellfire Club, who we'll get into it in the plot, but has a pivotal part to play, and then has a crazy uh, sort of end to her arc uh, by the finale. So I don't want to give away what happens to her just yet, but I do want to uh, give points for the sort of their performance behind her. I thought it was really well done. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think that yeah. she, and not only that, but like there were, a, she had a lot of opportunities to really be able to, to yes. emote and, yes. and a decent amount of screen time. And so I feel like whenever we got screen time with her, I was like, Oh, thank God she's back on the screen. Like yeah. Carrie, Carrie Walgren, please just <laughs> save us. fucking voice act your way out of this show. <laughs> what are you doing? It was good. It was good. Yeah. Man. Everybody else is like, okay, they're serviceable. Right. So like, we didn't get to hear too many more people, but they're 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 serviceable. Yeah. Like I heard Kitty Pride, Colossus, and Nightcrawler in the first episode, and they were all they all had kind of their accents and their little things to distinguish it. But eh, eh it was fine. Uh, the the woman it. who played Rogue, I thought was kind of good, but I did sort of miss the like the sugar like at uh -huh. the end of it from like the nineties. I was like, yep. Wait, what are we what are we doing? And that's not she, her. That's just bad writing. And that's the writing because she's not played as sort of this like crazy sex symbol that's like opposite Gambit, and they have like insane on fire chemistry she's played as sort of like this uh, on her own kind of emo loner who yeah. only really connected with logan and then when he said that he was going to leave temporarily she was super upset with him she ends up kind of in the wrong taking the wrong path for most of this season um it was just a very different different take on her 
and it, yeah. it was fine. I just didn't think it uh, quite. It didn't distinguish her really. She just looked like an emo mutant character. That's about it. <laughs> uh, really? Among many, I mean, Cyclops is always there, but uh, yeah, yeah. I just wanted them to like pull back at some point, and it's just like Scott Summers just listen to like the like Robert Smith the and the Cure. Cure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just in the background, just like really getting into it, really just like letting himself like a little bit of Morrissey, maybe, you know, just really kind of jamming hard about it. like going to a guitar store and looking at the inventory and being like, I'm going to buy that Les Paul one day, but he's not going to fucking buy that. He's Les. never like, going to buy it. He's never going to touch never gonna, it every day. Yeah. yeah he's never going to take lessons, like commit to it or just, you know, shit or get off the pot, Scott. But like, look, my, my favorite power of Cyclops is that he can cry emo laser tears. And that's really the best you can ask for. I don't know if that's a thing that they've ever introduced in this, but That'd I would love. I, I want to see that to in know. a what if, a Marvel what if. Oh my <laughs> god! I remember those what tears. ifs. Those were those so great. good. Those are fun. Uh, what if we talked about the first episode of this series briefly? Let's get into it. All right, cool. So this is called Hindsight Part One, and it essentially is a, is a great kind of like launching off point for this series. Basically, what happens is you see Wolverine at the X Mansion. He's packed up and ready to go. We don't know where, but he tells everybody he'll see them when he gets back. So it's cool. So it's just like, okay, he's not leaving. This isn't like a bad situation that he's leaving again. Like he's just temporarily going off to who knows, probably kill a lot of people. And then he'll be back. It's like totally fine. The people who don't like this, Gene is upset with Cyclops for some reason, but Gene also kind of blows Logan a kiss. So they're still kind of playing around with that whole love mm. triangle. Rogue <laughs> is the only one who's actually upset. So this is where we're introduced to kind of her like emo deal whatever it is but then as wolverine kind of goes to go up to uh xavier and say goodbye xavier kind of he gets that you know the typical like oh my head hurts so bad i'm I'm a psychic and i got a bad headache so you know shit's about to go down right so xavier and gene both have this like massive headache and then something just like explodes and then it wipes out that whole area and then logan wakes up a year later so we don't know what happened and we find out kind of the the details of what happened at the end of the series well, the end of the season and series. <laughs> Logan pieces it together a little bit as he goes along the way, but through flashbacks, we learn that a massive explosion happened, pretty much wiped out the mansion, and then Gene and Xavier disappeared. And after that, everybody disbanded. Now, the, um, the area beneath is still functional. Beast is still down there, and that's how we said Logan and Beast get back together. And then through kind of a run-in with the MRD, they, the, this mutant resource division, I think is what it was called, um, through a run-in with them, they decide to fight back, reform the X-Men, and, and gather up as many mutants as they can. So kind of rehashing the same story, mutants versus the government, mutants fighting back against oppression. Same kind of story, just with a different leader, different style. One interesting thing from this first episode, as they kind of trip through the city, there's these like video billboards that are all over the place that has Magneto inviting mutants to come to Genosha. Which I thought was a pretty cool, <laughs> pretty cool little thing to introduce. Like, yes, Magneto is here, and he's going to show up later. So don't you fret, because he does a, not appear in the first episode. He's also yeah. going to try to sell you a timeshare. He will, uh, and it'll be great. He's going to try to get you to move to Genosha. You know, yeah. you and a couple I'd other of your mutant friends. I'd go. Uh, well, you've got Pack you've my got toaster some powers, as, my skittles. Get your parkour stuff. All you need, mm-hmm. Dave. We know you got superpowers, and you're yep. super great. So yep. we're going to get That's you fun. that place in Genosha. You just have to th- sit through at least two hours of lectures to kind of understand how the financing options and how the sales totally fine and how you have to talk to your friends. Great. I get a plus Perfect. one, though, so you can come, too. Oh, great. Yes. Nice. Uh, let's jump to, let's jump 25 episodes in the future, as this series tends to do. Um, let, let's give them a little... You, say, um, you said it with such disdain. I, I want to call you out for that, because you're just like, this fucking show, we only... <laughs> You're like, I watched, I bookended this show, and I yeah, don't no, think I, I need to totally watch any more of it. It's totally my fault for not paying attention. But just to bring everybody <laughs> up to speed, right? So they, they do do a previously on, which is helpful, because otherwise, <laughs> to fuck is going on. So essentially, in the previously on, we see the Hellfire Club, which is composed of Emma Frost, Sebastian Shaw, and Celine, who I'm not familiar with, but she's apparently like another psychic. Yeah. They're essentially trying to trick Jean Grey, who's in this sort of dream state, they're trying to trick her to removing her mental barriers from the Phoenix Force, right? So she's got the Phoenix inside her at this point, and she's got psychic barriers around it, and they're trying to influence her to drop those uh, walls. But at the same time, she knows that she has a psychic connection to Scott, 
she knows he's in trouble because they also have him. So that is preventing her from releasing the, the Phoenix Force. That's one right. thing. We also know that the Sentinels now know the location of every mutant available, but at the same time, available, every mutant in existence, <laughs> but at the same time, Wolverine what, is this like mutant? Down. Is this like mutant Tinder? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, <laughs> whoever the Ooh. the single mutants are, the Sentinels are gonna Ooh. swipe left. I guess one of these days I got to figure out if it's left or right because I've made that reference a number of times on the show and I never know which way. It goes. I think you swipe right if you're interested, and you swipe left if you're not interested. So all Sentinels swipe right. Um, I I missed I missed the whole swiping yeah. game. I'm kind of glad so. we did. So yeah, yeah. I mean, for we better do, or for worse, we do want to form a uh, a cartoon account and go in and swipe left and right on people as like He Man or Lion O. I think I really, fun. I I really want to. I think it's just like I think maybe it's you and I talking with our significant others and being like, Make we're gonna sure do a joke. Cool we're guess. gonna do a bit on yes. Tinder. <laughs> we're gonna do a bit on Tinder and OK Cupid. Maybe Grinder. Are, are you? Okay, there you go. <laughs> get, definitely getting He Man up on them Grinders. And so, you know, it's one of those things where it's just like, we just want to make sure that, like, it's not something that, like, we're going to do, like, you yeah. know, for, you pick like, up my phone sexy and I purposes. Get an alert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's totally not yeah. sexy. I'm just a cartoon da- on a dating service. Yeah. This is just. So this it's is... more like, you know, <laughs> to call, the, call the psychiatrist more than anything else. I'm, I'm this not is the definitely going to become, like, a really weird SMC, like, after dark after kind of dark. moment. This is going to become a very strange catfishing episode. What if we get on there and then I match your cartoon character and you match my cartoon character? Yeah. I know. I think it's like by geography. So I think that, that we'd have to be like in the same area. I so, yeah. I have no um, clue how it works. I would yeah. just love the catfish episode where it's just like, well, I thought I was going to be meeting He-Man, but <laughs> it turns out. Like, what if you just show up dressed as He-Man? And you're, still not I'm quite sorry. the same. Yeah. yeah. This is a way more fun idea than the concept of this finale episode <laughs> i was waiting for you to take a dig at the show all right so again to set the stage so sentinels are swiping right on all available mutants but wolverine is swiping hard right on master Whoa. mold because he found master mold the creator of all sentinels right now so, that's in the future we don't know right. that yet but there's 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 current wolverine who with the x-men and shield apparently and even the mrd are trying to defeat the Sentinels, which have been taken over and repurposed by Magneto, because right. guess what? They're made of metal and microchips. He can manipulate those. In the future, Xavier, uh, Logan, Domino, the X-23 clones, Berserker, yeah. Bishop, Vanisher, they're all trying to take down Master Mold and the Sent- Sentinels there um, to save their world, essentially, and not be wiped out. And they're, they're, Xavier's there, and he's projecting back to his comatose self in the past yeah. To communicate with Wolverine about how best to handle the past. Does that make sense? Guys, not, not confusing at all. Do you actually know what Master Mold is? Well, it looked like a giant robot lady when she came out of the ground. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, like, the, the whole idea behind uh, Master Mold is that it is a robot. It is, it's, she is a sentinel, cre- like, a portable sentinel creating factory. Yeah. Where She's she can, out of a gene. Yeah. She just, uh, and she is massive. Like, she oh, is, yeah, like, huge. Five well, if you're going to birth the... a sentinel out of your vagine, you got to be at least three <laughs> times the size of a regular, regular sentinel. Yeah. I mean, is that how robot births out of a robot vagine works? If you're going to take the time to make a giant fucking sentinel birthing robot look like a giant human, then yeah, maybe just birth them from your vagine. At some point, somebody in a room had to be like, master mold has typically been like a male looking sentinel or just like a giant male... head at the center of like a, a production facility like it was in, in X-Men, right? It's just like a giant head. And right. I think when, he, when it comes alive, it's kind of like the whole facility almost like transforms around him. Like yeah. around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this was just like somebody had to be like, let's put robot titties on this. Let's make big sloppy robot titties and then yeah. birth sentinels from a vagine and then they'll just come up from the ground. This makes yeah. sense. It's for kids. This they is... love it. So much sense. Ugh. They love it. It's weird. But that's just one, one aspect of the weirdness. So, right. So, that's the future. We have future yep. robot vagine sentinel births swiping right. Gotta take hard. it down. Yep. Swipe right, right on that vagine. Yep. Um, then I, What's going I on know, in the I'm, past? What's going on right now? Going on in the past, as you mentioned, we have uh, the Hellfire Club, which is trying to coach 
some of this out. So I, I, I trying to coach the Phoenix Force out of Jean Grey. It's like that you said coach, like they're like coach. they're on the sidelines with like whistles and playbooks. Uh, Craig T. Nelson on coach. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> I'd love to see Craig T. Nelson powered up by the Phoenix Force. That'd be amazing. Oh my god, that'd be crazy. Yeah. He's on so fire. They have they have this thing where so like in the past they're trying to obviously we said uh, prevent Magneto, but there's a third area that we have to explore that we haven't talked about, which is inside Jean Grey's mind. Yeah, she's got like a dream state going on. Yeah, which is not difficult because if you're in the dream state, everything has a blue wash. If you're in present and day, it's like weirdly everything... slanted to the side and wobbly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you're in That's present you day, know. everything's normal. If you're in the mm-hmm. future, everything is like a red like kind of like red. copper <laughs> blood tone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like it's... copper blood tone is. My favorite sunscreen, by the way, and it is a sponsor of this show. <laughs> copper, God. copper, blood tone. Guys, it's almost summer, and mm-hmm. we care about Be your safe. skin. You should yeah. care about your skin as well. Mm-hmm. Pour some blood on it. Copper blood tone. Copper blood tone. SPF 1000. So we, we have very quickly this, this whole dreamscape thing that uh, Jean Grey is being manipulated to give up the Phoenix Force. And so they're playing and manipulating off of every whim that she possibly has. And let's talk about uh, who's manipulating her quick. Because we mentioned it was the Hellfire Club, the Inner Circle, but specifically, who are the psychics oh, that are kind of She's, doing this whole thing? We have the Stepford Cuckoos. Yeah, which sounds um, insane. And it kind yeah, of is. And it is, because you know why? Because they are all sisters that have been grown from an ova cell that was harvested from Emma Frost when yep, she so- was comatose after a sentinel attack totally not a creepy thing to do guys no nope. not a creepy thing to do either somebody make, make emma frost clones somebody went in and took a single ova cell mm-hmm. from her and was just Bajin. like yeah we are going to no because they take it from the stomach isn't that how i don't know i don't they make a new opening when they can just Maybe. hey if you can make I... a master mold birth and sentinels from your robot vagine i'd imagine you can pop an egg out of there there's a lot of things that are very creepy in this, and they don't really talk about them, nor do they want to talk about them, because no, then they'd, they have to explain, right over them. they'd have to explain to a whole bunch of people, they'd just be like, so this five-in-one, which is what they're also commonly referred to what? as when I not called, that. yeah, when not called, they're actually designated as Weapon 14. Oh, God. In the whole, like, Weapon X series of things, they're designated as Weapon 14. Interesting. Um, yeah. And so these, these ladies uh, have these psychic powers, uh, have this these magical abilities similar yep. to Emma Frost, and they are coaxing and and kind of manipulating Jean Grey to give up the Phoenix Force out of her. Yeah, and they're doing it through like dream states by having like various people in her life who she trusts uh, or doesn't trust. Like if they're if they're mimicking someone who's chasing her, who's threatening her, then they introduce somebody that she trusts as like an ally who basically says like, "Oh, we've got to run from Magneto, please." help you're not strong enough you got to tell me where this phoenix force is locked up so we can get it and we can defend ourselves so right. essentially like her dad comes in when that doesn't work she's like i really need charles xavier literally she just opens like a closet door and he's like hello gene <laughs> like the fuck okay i guess you're here hello then. gene it's hello, me gene. charles charles xavier charles. what seems to be the trouble gene god yeah uh but she like they, they're like they're draining the shit out of her and she's yeah. flipping out and it, it's like at parts, it doesn't seem like it's really going well. And then, yeah, she's definitely fighting back in part because Celine at the same time is like torturing Scott for some reason. I don't really know why we kind of missed that. So that's complicating things. And, and the complicating things further is where it gets interesting because Emma Frost comes in in what I assumed was a ghost state, but it's actually like her diamond state. Yeah. That's right. like her, her most like uh, invulnerable physical transformation. Right. And she comes in and basically like tries to save Scott under the pretense because she's in love with Scott. So under the pretense that Celine is messing up stuff with a Phoenix and Jean Grey, she's like, knock it off because you're screwing everything up in the other room. So cool it. And, and even, even as all this stuff is getting like fucked around in the present day, future Charles <laughs> Xavier is like, trust Emma Stone. Trust Emma, trust Emma Stone. Logan, trust Emma, trust Emma, Emma Stone. She I was so no close wrong. to saying it. <laughs> she's not, she in was in like, another Marvel property. <laughs> Easy A is an underrated film. Watch Superbad again. Emma oh. Stone is in it. I don't know why he's so, 
I don't know what his voice is. I don't know. Right but those two movies with Emma Stone are definitely They're great. great. They're fantastic. Fantastic. Oh, God. So. La La Land. Logan. I didn't, I'm not. <laughs> I haven't either, but trust Emma Stone. Just, just throwing out words now. <laughs> So there's a lot um, going on at the same time is what we're we're basically saying. The X Men are fighting the Sentinels in cool ways, but then there's we not a lot of snippets of right. And and t- there are so many battle scenes in this, and there's not a lot of substance because, like we said, no. they are they are just running. They are Usain Bolt running through this episode, just trying to wrap it up like so, as fast as possible. And essentially, like the only thing that takes place in the future is uh, that whole gathered team we talk about take on the Sentinels. They take on the Sentinel like dogs that show up, and they try to take down uh, Master Mold. Do right. you want to? Do you want to? Do you want to finish up what happens there so we can get back to the present and not try to jump back and forth? Well, they do you remember who shows to, up there? Uh, who? I mean, we have Bishop, who's in there. Yeah, but... so they've they've got Bishop, Berserker, Domino, uh, Xavier, Logan, and then Vanisher uh, is sort of like their teleporter. Yeah, and then the X twenty three clones. There's a bunch of right. them that are flying around cutting the Sentinels apart. They're actually doing really well taking down the future Sentinels doing a really good job until Wolverine tries to take down Master Mold, finds that he's protected by, well, she is protected by a force field. Right. And that's when more Sentinels rise up out of the ground. That's where the Sentinel like dogs come up out of the ground. And there's a lot of them. And right. they look like and it's they're ma- boned. And it's Magneto that shows up. No. What? That's Polaris. Oh, that was Polaris? That's Polaris. That's, uh, Oh, it was Lorna Polaris Dane. wearing, it was Polaris she's, wearing she's her got dad's the same kind her- of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, for some reason, I thought I was like, wait, hold up. Did we get a transgender Magneto? For yeah, two I had to I was look like, it up. I was like, when did Magneto get so sexy? I was like, how many fucking kids did Magneto have? Yeah, no, it's God, Polaris. Yeah. So, uh, and you're so right, it is up. Lorna Dane. Lorna Dane. Yeah. She shows up with Marrow, because like Marrow rolls up over the crest of this hill, and Xavier, surrounded by all these uh, sentinels, is like, Lorna! I'm I'm from England. I'm also Scottish over here. Hey, so Lorna, or hey, uh, Maro, how'd you find us? And Polaris is just like boom, and just like takes out all the Sentinels. So they think right. like, all right, we got this. We're sold. But things don't turn out super well for them because Master Mold is like super powerful and strong, and nearly kills a lot of them. Yeah. Do you kind of remember what happened in that sequence? Because it just looked like she went crazy and like cycloned them into something, and then that was it. it- it looks like all that happened was that it like uh, a bunch of stuff. Like, it, it was kind of like one of those like almost like nuclear nuclear yeah, yeah. explosion things where like stuff happens and then suddenly like uh, there's kind of like a white or like a blinding yeah. light and that was kind of it. And you're and like, that's it. Well, what the fuck? And then we okay. cut back to the past. And we cut back to the past, and yeah. then you're done. You're like, uh, I, I'm assuming in my brain what happened was Polaris just like blew everything away and i, I don't know, know like if it, it was her or if it was master mold um but i think it, it's weird because here's where you get into the paradoxes right because they change stuff in the past so even if they change stuff in the past would the future charles they were talking to be from that previous timeline or from a new one that has now existed because they changed yeah. the past they don't address it they just t- they just have a chat at the end of the episode <laughs> like nothing ever happened so and, screw and that then, for a while. We'll go back to the present and talk about that. And in these moments, you have to wonder to yourself, like, why would they get into this? It is so fucking hard to do yeah. time travel like Especially this. Especially with the amount of stuff they're trying to cram into 20 minutes. Yeah. And if, and if I can dig this in there, because they've been doing this yeah. not for 26 minutes. They've been doing this for like four seasons now. Knock it off, CW's Flash. The fuck are you doing? Yeah, you guys, he never learns. He never you learns. You guys. He never learns. Uh, but so we go, <laughs> we go back to the present. Yeah, what's up um, with Gene? Uh, Jean is now like, has she given up the Phoenix Force now at this point? She, when Xavier shows up and is just like, Jean, where's your Phoenix? Show me your yeah. pretty bird. Oh, uh, and they, the metaphor that they have for this is she walks over in her dreamscape and there is a, like a, there's like a canary in like a, 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 a in a bird like a cage that has like cage, a, yeah. that has like a cover on it. And so she yeah. goes over and I'm like, guys, how, guys, how did you not see that this was in this stupid bird cage like i think i think for that because it is kind of like a dream state like that's just like her mental projection of it right so when she finally when they finally say like where is it then she reveals where it's been this whole time so it's kind of like you couldn't see it until she allowed you to see it i was fine Uh, the dream state thing was cool yeah all right so she uh she does this opens it up lets go of the the phoenix force this thing comes bursting out of her so fucking fast 
Uh, and and I, I can't remember, is this the moment where it seemed like the Stepford Cuckoos? So with their magic abilities, yeah. they're able to like take on the Phoenix Force. Well, there are other psychics too, right? So <clears throat> the reason that Jean is able to kind of like contain and somewhat control and, and channel the Phoenix energy is that she's a powerful psychic. So she can fight back against its kind of right. primordial energy and, and control. So split amongst the five of them, yeah, they're somewhat able to manage it and control it. So that's why they all get like <laughs> instant Phoenix gear and they get like cool Phoenix aura and they're all like glowing and, and on fire. And yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. Oh boy. And like, and like in this moment, then they pretty much blow out of this popsicle stand. Well, Sebastian then, gives them uh, gives them a order. Oh, does he uh, tell them to to get rid of? What does he say to them? He says uh, he says it's now time to crush the X Men, destroy the Sentinels, and burn oh, Genosha to the ground. So they literally right. want to take out every other mutant um, opposition to them, um, just because that's their thing. Um, and that's what I'm they kind of de- start to do. They start by attacking the Sentinels. Start and this by is where their... Magneto gets his ass handed to him, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. And I mean, like, so what happens, Dave, with Magneto getting his ass handed to him? Yeah, so we kind of cut back to the city where, like, Beast, Beast is firing missiles. Um, all the other X-Men are doing, like, random things um, to take down the Sentinels sort of one by one. So Kitty Pryde has a cool takedown where she just drops. She phases into the internal circuitry of... Uh, Sentinel, you don't see what she does, but she walks away and the whole thing kind of just like explodes. At one point, like Storm fries one of their heads with electricity, just like a toad. Uh, at another point, Nightcrawler like literally teleports the head of one Sentinel away from its body, which was a pretty cool little move. Beast, for whatever fucking reason, decides to shoot missiles at Magneto. And we've already talked about what happens. Does not end well for Beast. Um, but at this point then, the Phoenix Five, uh, Phoenix Force Five, show up and they essentially like <laughs> take Magneto out like he like in a in a blink like he even has this like look of fear on his face he's done he's down for the count oh, oh. the only thing that saves him from like smashing into magnet paste on the ground is, is a fellow by the name of Quicksilver yeah who Quicksilver. shows up and catches him and he's like hello father i have rescued your life yeah stupid and like and then so he's out of the picture and in these like final moments suddenly you're just like oh no like you know they're gonna they're gonna try to attack you know the rest of the x-men this is part of their mission that they've been right. given and so as they're going to fight suddenly the x-men emma frost steps out in front of uh in front of them and just absorbs all of the phoenix force so so real quick cutting back um when the Phoenix came out of Jean Grey, Jean Grey was then awoken and Emma actually stepped in and took out the rest of the inner circle. So she used her powers to take out the rest of Celine, Sebastian Shaw, take them out. At the right. same time, Wolverine was like trying to get into the inner circle, but he was taken out by the, the guys they had outside because him against the psychic attack is basically like they can yeah. take him down pretty easily. Um, and the weird thing was like, you don't really even see what he does for the rest of the episode. This entire series and season has been like focused on Logan. But by the end of this episode, like, he has nothing to do. <laughs> like, yeah. in the future and in the present, he has nothing to do, which is so, such a weird switch. So, so Emma Frost takes out yeah. the inner circle. and She then takes them out. And then Jean Grey then, wakes up. Yeah. And she sees and like, Emma attempting to uh, resuscitate Scott. Right. Especially as she just sees this, like, <laughs> this, this gussied up whore over her man. And she uses, what, like, cables, tentacles, something to, like, Secure her up against the, the wall. So Emma's right. trapped there. Yeah. So yeah. So Jean and Scott head to the city. Jean is trying to head off the Phoenix Force in the city. She's ready to basically like give herself up as host again. Well, Scott's not ready for that. Scott's like, I already lost you once to this entity and we're not doing it again. And he probably should have been killed <laughs> from when they ran into him. Yeah. Guys, so then, it's, the sa- it's the same Phoenix Force yep. kind of bullshit that we've heard in every movie and yep. every comic. It's like, like, there was nothing new to this. It was no. just really kind of rehashing and updating it for a new audience who was probably already familiar with it from the movies and the comic books and previous cartoons that were better. The coolest part, though, was what you mentioned about Emma, because this, if, if you go through this whole thing, before we talk about what happens to Emma, we learn from Celine back when she was sort of torturing Scott. Celine gives up the whole um, reality of what happened that day a year ago. So originally it was Emma Frost's plan. Emma and her cuckoos were going to, sounds so stupid, they were going to attack Jean 
to try to extract the Phoenix Force so that they could control it and become like the most powerful. I think she actually wanted to get rid of it. She wanted to send it away before it matured so she could protect the world. That was her initial plan. But then once the Hellfire Club got involved with it, they wanted to harness it. That wasn't part of her plan. They wanted to harness it and use it for their own their own good, their own evil, whatever. When she tried to attack Jean, Jean fought back with the Phoenix power. So when the Phoenix emerged, that detonated pretty much the entire mansion and everything. So that ruined everything. At, it wasn't bad enough that that's what Emma did. So then they took Jean into captivity. They also took Xavier and then like dropped him on the, the beach of Genosha and just like dropped his body off there where he was found later to make it look like Emma had found him and did the team a favor so that they would trust her. So she's gone from trying to save the world to be kind of being duplicitous, but also trying to be a team member, member that they could trust, but also working for the Hellfire Club, also being in love with Scott, also trying to um, get the Phoenix Force out of Jean Grey, and then eventually, in the end, like you said, she stands in front of the Phoenix, and then what happens? I really wanted you to say, in the end, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. Because <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> In the end, uh, she's actually their savior, and she yeah. prevents Jean Grey from having to, to reabsorb the Phoenix Force, and she takes it into herself instead, yeah. and she sort of has this final moment, again, very, very quickly, with no yeah. resolution, where she's kind of going into her diamond state, or it yeah. sort of looks like she's chipping apart. She's like trying to hold herself together of... physically to hold this force inside. Yeah. Right. And so uh, whether she was trying to kind of solidify her body in order to keep it inside... Uh, or it was just her, like the Phoenix Force just kind of like breaking her apart from the inside. Uh, you know, she's not in a good position right now. <laughs> no. And she's just like, go, run away. And like, and so they do. <laughs> and that's, they're yeah. just like, bye. Bye. Thanks we're out, so we're much. out of here. Bye. Yeah. And she like explodes from the inside and like the Phoenix Force takes off into the, into the sky. So that's gone. Yeah. So. This should be like Emma Frost's like kind of swan song from beginning to end because she set everything into motion and then she did an ultimate sort of flip and self-sacrifice at the end, uh, which is pretty, that's pretty tough, man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's like for a kid's cartoon, I mean, you know, where yeah. there were probably not a lot of deaths no. in this entire series, like, you know, or I mean, maybe there were in the future. We have no idea because it's unexplained. You know, we have somebody who uh, who does a little self sacrifice at the end yeah, of this one, and it's uh, nice. it 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 felt even for just watching the one episode, I was like, "This is earned. I'm cool with this. Let's just get this over with." So speaking of, we got two more quick stinger scenes to talk about here. So Whoa. speaking of speaking of things that get over with quickly, like Magneto was thrown from his perch atop a sentinel, right? Hit the ground. His son Quicksilver saves him, and then it, and then Magneto's just like, "Fuck this. I'm out." He's like, "I don't want to do. I don't want to deal with this shit anymore." I was having fun yeah. when I was winning, but now that I'm losing, like, I don't want to do this. He's just like, run me home to Genosha. <laughs> like, literally pick me up and run me home. So they go back to Genosha, where he is no longer welcome anymore. His daughter, right. Wanda, Scarlet Witch, has sort of taken over. Says, you are no longer welcome here. Her sister, yeah. uh, Polaris, uh, is with her. And Blink is also there with her. Yeah. Quicksilver stands by his dad's side, so Blink just... Blinks both of them back somewhere else. That's it. it was no really more fun. for Genosha. It looks like Blink took like one of those like uh like homeopathic healing crystals it and looked just like a threw, glow stick to me. Like yeah. threw like two rave glow sticks at Pew. Quicksilver and Magneto and just like and you're gone and you're gone. As, as also to say like they know where this is. <laughs> yeah, they, they need to be they, back. They, Quicksilver they literally here. just ran there from New York. Yeah. Oh boy. Oh boy. So yeah, they but I mean, it up you know, fairly quickly. Yeah. Uh, we have this. Uh, we have this moment where uh, finally, um, so the whole know, team's kinda... back together, right? Right. All the X Men are back together. Uh, Rogue is sort of apologizing to to Logan for for something that she's done, which we're being didn't a turd see, all which... the way back in the first episode. Yeah, it really has no consequence to what's going on, and nobody nah. really cares about it because the majority of the people have forgotten about it that it existed. And there, then he's just like, "Let's go see what Chuck has to say." <laughs> so they walk over and. You know, Charles, again, not addressing the problem with time travel or the future fact, but Charles is kind of like in this yeah. comatose state, still, but he's communicating, he's communicating to them through a uh, Tupac hologram over yep. top of uh, his body. And he's just like, you did it. And they're just like, great, cool. And he's like, what was the final line? He's like, but I don't think you're going to have much time to relax. Something or, or terrible. Like, something, something awful and foreboding or like verboding and like, 
and then they zoom up and then it's like they go over like a hill yeah, into another this is back city. in the future now future charles right and like in future like they have all of these like pyramids that are now look like they're drilling into the earth's like crust and like and then it just kind of zooms in and that's when all of a sudden you hear people in like people just chanting apocalypse 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 and then you see yeah they just with brin and then you see uh you see sinister you see evil scott summer and you see apocalypse come out and you're just like who are the other four horsemen or who the other two horsemen in yeah or at least at least two if not three yeah. yeah two two more so I was just like, ah, okay. Like, that was kind of a, an interesting way. I mean, they teed yeah. it up for season two. Just yeah. bummer that they didn't get it. Yeah, I don't know. Is it a bummer? Because you don't seem super no. thrilled. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not bummed out about this. I thought, I thought it was okay. I mean, those are our opinions. But there are folks out there with a different opinion. Yeah. So I think I'm going to take the, this is time for Love It or Hate It, your favorite part of the show. I think I'm going to take Love It tonight. How's that sound? Yep, get it. This comes from, I don't know, because his name didn't copy, apparently. Uh, so somebody <laughs> from 2008, which I don't know how that happened. They must have watched it overseas because it didn't open here in the states till 2009. This is very suspect. All of a sudden, uh, <laughs> it's titled "Amazing." Now I'm gonna go and watch it again. So this morning I watched the first episode of Wolverine and the X Men. I was like, "All right, X Men Evolution was cool. I'll give this a shot." Now let me tell you, I'm a huge comic book fan, but in a cool way. A way that attracts women, you know? Nice. Anyways, so I watched the first episode, thought it was pretty good. I liked the plot of it, but it wasn't enough to completely grab my attention. I just watched the second episode. Wow! Amazing! If you watched the first and thought it was alright, watch the second! Something about seeing all those familiar faces and the forming of the X-Men Brotherhood just grabbed me and whipped my face against the wall and said, This is awesome. Once the complete first season comes out, if they break it apart like Evolution, by the way, I might actually run into a wall over and over again. I might break all contact with the world for a week and bring my laptop into some vast abandoned forest or something and just replay it over and over again. Stay off the grids, you know? 10 out of 10. (laughs) Guys, let's get into this hate it. So this is obviously somebody who did not enjoy this. This comes from X underscore bad with two D's from Jamaica, (laughs) February of 2011. Uh, And he gives this a three out of 10 stars. And he says the most boring Wolverine cartoon of all time. There's only one. uh, Yeah, there's, there's a, there's a lot to this. So indulge me. Uh, This cartoon really isn't impressive. And anybody who doesn't agree is a Wolverine fan. Wolverine and his (laughs) X-Men as, as I call it is all about Logan. I know he's popular, but the whole point of a team is that everyone get their, gets their own time in the spotlight. This show was all about, quote-unquote, Wolverine, not the X-Men. They are merely there as his lackeys. It's not impossible for Wolverine to become the leader, but the circumstances have to be right. Storm, Nightcrawler, even Beast could have done a better job, especially considering uh, that they have successfully filled these roles or filled that role of leadership in the past. The overall plot was disappointing. Uh, we were led uh, on from episode one and only saw progress right before the season finale. Some characters simply just fell flat. Blob and Toad were simply empty shells of their former selves. These guys were never smart or powerful, but you could, you could get where they were coming from and what, motivates the, or what motivated their action. But in this series, they were just numbskulls. Emma Frost was also disappointing. I know there were challenges making her character more appropriate for kids, but it seems to be pointless and boring, whereas Emma, I'm used to, uh, is complex and intriguing. I expected that from a team led by Logan would encourage more action, but the fight sequences were mainly disappointing. Continuity was also screwed up. Forge was a kid slash tech guy, and Kitty was acting like a babysitter on their missions. Here's an accomplished Native American shaman and, his veter- er, and a veteran uh, from the Vietnam War who needs the protection of a teenage girl. I wasn't aware X-Men were in the business of babysitting mutant babies. Mystique had this whole fabricated history to tie, in, uh, to tie her in with Wolverine more than her kids, Nightcrawler, and Rogue. I realized the series tried to incorporate a multitude of X characters, which was noble, but ultimately it fell short in the characterization department. 
Uh, the only reason I gave this show three stars is because I enjoyed Nightcrawler and the Cyclops solo episodes, the season finale, and a few scenes with Kitty and Rogue. Three, three out, out of ten. Of tens That's and a rough, stars. That is a rough Man. score. What about you, buddy? Oh. Do you uh, recommend this? And if not, do you give it the dip, meaning you erase it from all existence? I don't recommend this. Ooh. I, I, I don't recommend this, uh, but if I, with the obvious caveat that if you really love X-Men and you're just like, oh, I got to watch it all, just watch the finale. You're going to get all you need to know in the finale, and that's really it. That's like, I'm glad that I watched this final episode. I do not think I'll go back and watch more. And if somebody asked me, like, what X-Men series should I, I watch, I would not recommend that they check this one out. Yeah, it's tough because... It said it's what, the fourth one the Kitty Pride and the X-Men didn't really count because it was kind of just like a precursor to X-Men, the animated series, I think. Um, you know, I might be wrong on that one. I'm not sure when that came about. But honestly, if you're going to watch an X-Men series, just watch the one from the 90s. And then X-Men Evolution was pretty good, too. This just doesn't really offer enough anything different. It's just like a, a, a diluted kind of rehash of the other stuff. I have a tough time recommending something that I'm not going to watch any more episodes of. <laughs> yeah. Or don't even have like the inclination to do so. I know people out there love it though. So if you guys disagree with us, feel free to to send us an email, maybe, you know, send us a, an episode that's your favorite or a moment that's your favorite and and tell us to check it out. But yeah, I'm going to say there's better X-Men shows to watch than this one. I don't think I can recommend it. Doesn't get the dip. Doesn't get the dip. It's not that bad. It's not yeah. offensive to the senses. It's just It's not offensive and there's a really talented cast yeah. who is doing all the voiceovers and it's a shame that this just wasn't a better show. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's the, that's the end culmination of this this show. It's a shame. Moving on to next time. But all don't right. worry. I think we'll have more that we have to deal with in the future. Apocalypse. 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 I just want to watch I just want to watch like a bro series about sinister evil scott and apocalypse just see what they're up to like, what bro apocalypse the bro apocalypse what are yeah. they up to yeah wood watch mr mr Cine- mr cinebro cinebro does he work at a cinnabon <laughs> he does does he in an air- he's a cinnabon in an manager <laughs> so he's a cinnabon manager evil scott works for the postal service <laughs> i think apocalypse like runs an incubator for like startup tech companies that makes sense yeah we got yeah. it Bro I'm on board. Done. Nice. Tune in next time to hear more about it. <laughs> Followed by Cactors. All right, yes. but what do you have? What do you have coming up <laughs> in the next couple of weeks for folks out there? Uh, guys, as always, uh, I do live improv comedy in Washington D.C. with Washington Improv Theater. The group is called Knox. That's N-O-X, and you can find tickets, information, and showtimes at witdc.org. And I'm always on Twitter and Instagram at Sean Paul Ellis. And you can find me on Twitter at DrClawMD. You can also find me over on Collider.com, Nerdist.com, and DaveTrumbor.com. If you're interested in finding out more about this show right now, you can check out our Patreon page, <laughs> Patreon.com slash Saturday Morning Cartoons. Remember, it's a morning with a U. You can also head on over to SaturdayMorningCartoons.com. Find us on Twitter at MorningTunes. Check out Sean's handiwork on our Instagram page. Keep the conversation going on Facebook. And listen to our free audio podcast each and every week through YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. Also, feel free to tell us that we're wrong and we're idiots for not liking Wolverine and the X-Men by sending us an email, saturdaymorningcartoons at gmail.com. I think that's going to wrap it up for this week, but we've got a lot more Marvel May to come. And it's probably going to get worse. Not real sure how the next couple (laughs) weeks are going to go. It could be good. Could be a surprise. We've got a BET series coming up. What? Uh, Can't wait. Can't wait. Yeah. We've got a Malibu comic series coming up. What? I can wait on that one. I can really, really wait on that one. Ooh, I can take a knee. We gotta do it anyway. No, we gotta I do know, it. I know. I know. And then we're gonna we're gonna do a throwback with a. Is it a sixties or seventies series? Which one do we I think go it's back a to? Sixties series. Is it a sixties series? Going to the wayback machine. Yeah. Yeah. Tune in for uh. the excitement. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a good time, guys. Join us for more Marvel May next time. And thank you for listening to Saturday Morning Cartoons. See you. Hey, everybody. Thanks a lot for listening to Saturday Morning Cartoons. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to transform and roll out.